Hey everyone, welcome to another First Impressions card review of the new Arkham Horror the Card Game Mythos Pack, The Secret Name. Yep. Uh, my name is Brandon, and I'm here with my friend Steven again. Hi. We made it through the whole Circle Undone box last time, and hopefully this will be quite a bit quicker. A lot, <laughs> lot fewer cards. Thinner, thinner stack of cards. If you're joining us for the first time on Optimal Play, the bread and butter of our channel is actually live playthroughs of board games and tabletop games, including Arkham Horror, the card game, which is one of my favorite features that we're doing. Check that out if you haven't had the chance. But we wanted to add a little bit more talking about the new products and the games that we love to the channel, so here we are for the second time talking through the newest cards in the game. Yep. Before we get started, though, I thought it would be fun to revisit some of what we had to say last time now that we've had a chance to actually play with the cards. Uh, did you say anything you regret? Uh, yeah, so I think probably the biggest mistake I made was underestimating the uh, the new skill cards. Oh, right. um, so for example, when we reviewed Steadfast, um, I said that it was probably only good in Carolyn. That's definitely not true. <laughs> um, so for, right. you know, Steadfast is something that can give you up to three fight icons and three will icons. Um, and you know, it doesn't give you a card draw like Guts or Overpower, but three is still a lot more powerful than two. Um, and <laughs> the is. flexibility of doing either one. Um, is really good. Um, I've been liking it a lot in Joe. Um, you know, Guts would not be enough to let Joe pass a willpower test. Like, that's, he's just so bad at will. But, like, three is, is often enough. And then three fight is really good in Joe. Right. Uh, can help you hit those boss enemies. Um, so, yeah, and I, and I think the Rogue one and the Survivor Seal card are also pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I think just in general, we didn't quite take this seriously enough. I know I said with Steadfast in particular, which is maybe the only one I've played with, it's just really good. I've said that it's not there to help you in a clutch. Uh -huh. Like when, when you really like, like the desperate cards, which are much more powerful, the worse you're doing. The thing is, when you have really good cards like Steadfast in your deck, you're less likely to ever <laughs> hit that situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is also really strong. Yep. And Steadfast gets worse as you take damage, but I find I'm often taking out some of my um, skill cards when I level up with XP. So like at the end of a campaign when I have trauma, I'm, I might have replaced Steadfast by then. That's but the early scenarios. A great point. So. Okay, the card I want to revisit is Deny Existence. Um, I actually, I looked back and we pretty much glossed over it. We looked mm -hmm. at it, we were like, yeah, this is support for Diana, it cancels the thing, she'll mm -hmm. get a willpower from it. Um, no, that card is bonkers good. <laughs> I think that Mystics have their equivalent of Lucky, like the, mm -hmm. the event that you need to have a really good reason not to put in your deck. Mm -hmm. It's fast, it's free, it, even though it cancels supposedly just one aspect of a treachery card or something, most of them just do one thing or mm -hmm. let you choose between two things. And so it's basically a free cancel. And also it's, it's, it's a free dodge because mm -hmm. Usually canceling the, uh, well, so a lot of enemies do just damage or horror, so it definitely cancels that entirely. But also a lot of the time, one of those is the one you're scared of. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and being able to cancel the, the one that's actually threatening your life is pretty much as good as dodging it. And it's free. I can't say <laughs> that. can't say that enough times. Not needing to keep any resources mm -hmm. to play it is ridiculously good. So the other thing. I had taken the name Deny Existence to just be like, hands over your ears, like completely like, la la la, I can't hear you. Um, it dawned on me that it's actually like denying something the right to exist, mm -hmm. or at least that's the double meaning, which mm -hmm. makes the card that much more badass and also yeah. for that reason. Totally. <laughs> Do you think uh, you would take Ward of Protection out of any Mystic decks, or are you always running them both? Hmm. Um, I actually don't always run Ward of Protection. What? Yeah, sometimes I upgrade into Ward Protection 2. The mid-level mid one is 2, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes yeah. I upgrade it to that from another card because mm -hmm. it's quite a bit better than uh -huh. Ward Protection 0. But yeah, a lot of the time I'm okay just having more things in my deck that help me win as opposed to help me not lose. Mm -hmm. And so, so that is one that, I mean, it's, it's a great card, but mm -hmm. it gets cut sometimes. I think I am more likely to play two copies of Deny Existence and a little less likely to play Ward Protection because of Deny Existence. Oh. Wow. <laughs> have you had a chance to play with it? I have not yet, no. Oh, okay. Diana is the one new box investigator I have not played, and uh, I didn't fit it in my Mari, um, but maybe it should have been. But Yeah, I think anyone that can take it <laughs> should take it until further notice. With that, want to give us the first new card? Yeah, so we have not looked at these except for a couple previews. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a Guardian asset here, something worth fighting for. Um, it's got a picture of a gun and a black and white 
a photo of a family. Well, okay. So it's a talent, something worth fighting for, maybe assigned horror dealt to other investigators at your location. Ah, uh, okay. So oh. the, the, the flavor text is, I can't die here, not now, not yet. And this is just uh, true grit, but for horror. Yes. It's the identical card, basically. So true grit, I don't know about you, true grit's not a card that I run very often. Yeah, I mean, like, Mark might run it for, like, one scenario, and then you upgrade it into Brother Xavier immediately. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I look at this and kind of think, also probably something I won't run very often. Yeah, not super excited about it. Yeah, and it's not, like, Carolyn can't heal this, right? Since it's a talent. It's, uh, so it's, I mean, there are some cards that can heal it, I think. That can remove horror from a non-investigator or ally? Her signature might. I can't mm. remember. There's, okay. there's probably something, but... You know, she already has so much horror healings, you really need horror soak as well. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. That's kind of the last thing she needs. Um, okay, yeah, not a whole lot to say about this one, but it parallels True Grit. I like sy symmetry. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, our seeker card is Crack the Case, a zero-cost insight event that says, Fast, play after an investigator discovers the last remaining clue at your location. Investigators at that location gain a total of X resources distributed as you wish. X is the location's shroud value. And from a piece of literature I've never heard of, The Adventure of the Blanched <laughs> Soldier, we have the quote, When you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Hmm. Um, I, I think I like it. So, first of all, it's an insight. So yep. it's an option for Joe. Yep. Generates... Although he's not getting any savings on it since it is zero. But true, you don't get to take advantage of his minus two. But it does still generate yeah. several resources. Yeah. This is the second card that triggers off getting the last clue off of location, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, you know I tried putting that four cost one in a deck, um, the one that lets you get clues on other locations after you discover the last one. That was really hard to make work. Um, now part of that was that it was four cost, and you don't always have four mm -hmm. cost. And it also required there to be another lower shroud location in play that had clues. So that one had a lot more conditions. Right. But um, that did that card was definitely a lot worse than I thought it would be. Same. And this one, I would say, is probably better because, like you pointed out, there's no cost, so yep. no condition to be able to play it. And if it's on Joe's insight deck, even though it doesn't take advantage of his power, mm -hmm. he does get to play it that round if he mm -hmm. if he finishes or um, if anyone at the location finishes off the clues. It's situational in that you might not want to use it in a one or two shroud location, but mm -hmm. other than that, at least, yeah, you'll you'll get value out of it almost every time you draw it. And I really like the flexibility that if you're fine on resources, you can just give it to someone else at the location. So. Yes. Also, that's, yeah, very true. As someone who mostly plays multiplayer, that kind of flexibility, team, it's... Is this the second card after teamwork that can let you give other people... Oh, I mean, Carolyn's investigator card. Oh, but, true. Stand together. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's some. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's the first non-guardian source of giving Maybe. resources to other people. Yeah. So. I'm not sure, but it's an exciting option to have. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you give us Intel reports? Ooh. So this one is a two-cost event, uh, favor and service, um, and the first line is just discover one clue at your location. So. Okay. That's already good. I already um, like it. Then there's a uh, fast action. When you play Intel Report, you can increase its cost by two to change discover one clue to discover two clues. So, two, uh, well, I guess $4 for two clues. Um, not bad, especially really good in Preston. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last thing, fast action. When you play Intel Report, increase its cost by two, change at your location to at a location up to two connections away. So for six, you can get two clues on basically the other side of the map, like two Two connections is pretty far. That seems great. I'm not sure it's worth it for anyone but Preston. <laughs> uh, yeah, Preston, maybe Jenny, um, maybe Safina. Um, so actually, this was spoiled um, on another uh, podcast. Um, so you, can, I, you can name drop them. Uh, Mythos yeah, Busters, right? Mythos yeah. Busters. <laughs> I heard that too. Um, so they already have kind of analyzed the rules of this. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for those who aren't you know, on the chat groups and stuff, um, if Safina painted worlds this, um, she can uh, reduce it with Uncage the Soul, and including reducing the extra two. Oh, because it increases the cost. Yeah. Nice. So I think, okay. I think Safina would consider this, um, you know, if you're Uncaging the Soul and you're only paying one to discover two clues. Um, That's solid. Yeah. So. Although, is that two card combo plus a resource better than Drawn to the Flame, which is just... 
Yeah, it's, you know, clues. it depends how scary yeah. the encounter deck is, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or I guess you can run all you know, two copies of each yeah. this way. Yeah, and you know, maybe you want to get them across the map too. So. Yeah. I gotta say, I'm not a fan of the seven lines of text for this effect. It is I, a lot of text. I can't believe they didn't keyword this. Yeah. I, I, I listened to the reveal podcast that Mythos Busters did too, and by the end of the podcast, they were all just calling it Kicker, which is the, mag <laughs> the magic, the gathering yeah. keyword for this exact effect. It's, um, it boggles my mind that they didn't keyword this, and I've seen that they previewed another one, so it's not mm -hmm. one of a kind either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as its function, I'm excited to try it. I'm curious whether it's worth it for anyone but Preston. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, guaranteed Guaranteed things are generally pretty good. Um, I mean, some of them, uh, Shovel and, and um, the, the, the Yorick ones, I'm not huge on, but mm -hmm. but yeah. Definitely a big boost for Preston. And I'm yeah. sure everyone who tried Preston out in the box is like, why wasn't that there? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, you know, swap into your campaigns now. It's level yeah. zero, but you're, you're adaptable, you're Preston. Exactly. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Sign Magic is a mystic asset that costs three. It's a ritual and a talent. It takes up a hand slot. Okay, right. Okay, I see what they're doing there. I'm looking at the art. Mm -hmm. You're like conjuring the sign. I don't think we've seen any talents in the hand slot yet. It's fast, and you have one additional arcane slot, which can only be used to hold a spell or ritual asset. The body is but an extension of the mind. Hmm. Okay, I've been wondering when they were going to put out a permanent that gives you an extra arcane slot. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not going to, <laughs> but we got sign magic. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know, I think I would put this in a few characters. Um, I've thrown Book of Shadows in a couple of uh, uh, mystics, G almost entirely for that arcane slot. You almost never have time to actually, you know, uh, exhaust it and add a charge to something. Um, and that is four cost, it's not fast, and it costs three XP. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely any any deck where you were going to put in Book of Shadows for the slot, you would certainly put in this. Sure. Um, it's not amazing. You know, three cost is still a lot for a slot, and it's not going to be in all Mystics. No. Yeah, three cost. I mean, it is fast, at least. Mm -hmm. So you can... Well, if you you can play it in a pinch theoretically, but none of the arcane slot cards are fast, right? So it's not like you can sneak mm -hmm. this and an arcane spell in without taking it, or not, or, or excuse me, not like you can slip this and an arcane slot card in without taking an opportunity attack or something, even yeah. though this is fast. Yeah. Hmm. It's pretty niche, yeah. I think. Even though, like, I'm usually pretty comfortable running two copies of each of three spells filling the arcane slot because you rotate through them as they run out of charges mm -hmm. or you just don't draw one of them. I, it's rare that I feel the need for three Yeah, slots. you have to be doing something like <laughs> sealing, um, you know, with protective incantations mm -hmm. and seal of seven signs, stuff like that. Right, actually, that's a good point. Those are some cards that I haven't played much of because they take up an arcane slot yeah. and I need, that for, I need those for my shrivelings and my rights of seeking. So, okay, it's growing on me just because yeah. this kind of opens up the ability to play with more of those, the more fun spells and that aren't so... Um, aren't so necessary. Yeah, exactly. I do feel like since it's doing nothing else, it would be nice if it didn't take up a hand slot. Like the fact that you're spending mm -hmm. three just to change one slot into a different slot, like hand slots are still pretty nice for mystics. You've got Chthonian Stone, you've got Spirit of Thame, Ritual Candle, so. Yeah, agreed. It's a little bit of a bummer. Especially, I would really rather just spend three experience on this and have it be a permanent. Yes, agreed, agreed. Oh well. Maybe there'll be a leveled up version. <laughs> we can actually, sure, yeah, make, just make a leveled up version of this that is a permanent. I don't think we've seen a card with the same name upgrade into a permanent, but I don't see why not. Yeah. All right, maybe in um, maybe in return to the circle, <laughs> it's just around the corner, I'm sure. Yeah. Another Mystic card is next. Yeah. So, do you think that there's actually going to be more Mystic cards in the cycle because there are two Mystics in the cycle, or do you think it's just a fluke and it's going to be? different every pack probably not because there um there was the same amount in the box um so if they mm, were gonna true. if they were gonna have it be different it probably would have started with the box touche okay i'm convinced well what do we got uh banish um so this is a spell it's two cost an event um and it says evade use only on a non-elite enemy this uses will instead of agility if you succeed move the enemy just evaded to any location in play any location okay if hmm. you succeeded and one of the face symbols was revealed, uh, that enemy does not ready during the next upkeep phase. Oh, so it's actually good if you reveal one of the face symbols. Normally it's bad. Yes, the only other one where it's good is the 
It's on the tip of my tongue, the one that cancels an attack. Hypnotic gaze. That's one. Yeah. Um, I was, as I was reading this, I was about to say I've never found those evade and move things useful, but this is the first one I think that moves it to any location. I think this is the first time we've gotten able, we've gotten to move enemies. Uh, no, right? survivors can do it. Mm, you're right. Okay. I keep several times this time that I've said, is this the first time? And no, it's not. So maybe <laughs> I just need to stop saying that. Uh, I think you didn't say this as you read it, but it is a level one card. So you're talking oh, about right. yep. spending an experience point to get it. Yep. I like it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It feels like my brain almost wanted to think that the evasion is the effect of the spell just using willpower, and mm -hmm. then the bonus is moving the enemy. But mm -hmm. it's actually that moving the enemy is built in, and there's an additional potential bonus for the icons. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty strong. Yeah, I kind of like how, I, I feel like with Blinding Light, like sometimes you use it because you really need to evade, other times you use it because you really need to do damage. You're, you're often not really benefiting from both. Mm. So for those times when you're using Blinding Light to evade, this is just better because it lets you move them, they might not ready. Um, so I would definitely try it out. And sending them anywhere is pretty flexible because you can either send them to the furthest location or one that, you know, if you're playing Lost in Time and Space, one that isn't even connected to anything. Yep. Or you could just send them to your guardian friend <laughs> and have them take their turn after you and just kill whatever it is outright. Totally. Um, I'm a fan. I look yeah. forward to trying this. Definitely. Okay, our survivor card is Meat Cleaver. Okay, awesome. I love the art. <laughs> <laughs> the bloody butcher block with the Meat Cleaver on it. All right, I'm sold already. It's a three cost asset. It's an item, it's a weapon, and it's melee traded. Takes a hand slot and says, as an action, fight, you get plus one combat for this attack, plus two instead if you have three or fewer remaining sanity. Oh, I thought that was a Carcosa cycle theme, <laughs> but we're back. Yep. If this attack defeats an enemy, you may heal one horror. As an additional cost to initiate this ability, you may take one horror to have this attack deal plus one damage. Oh, it smacks a fire axe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Where you can use it, pay a cost to then get rewarded for being in worse shape because you paid mm -hmm. the cost. Yep. Um, is it good? Hmm. Um, you know, survivors need more weapons. Yes. So I think it's good just for that. Um, you know, like if you're relying on Calvin or um, Rita or Preston to be your main fighter, um, it can get real scary when they don't draw their fire axe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, York can have the guardian weapons, but those other guys can't. Um, so I think you're going to include at least one just so that if you don't draw Fire Axe, you have something. Right. Um, whether there's people that will prefer it to Fire Axe, um, maybe. Hmm. I, you know, it's going to depend a lot on the kind of deck you're building. If you like to keep a low resource count, then Fire Axe is better. And if you don't want to have to worry about keeping them down or you want to run this in... Preston or someone, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? This is a new option for him. He can't take most of the yep. rogue weapons because exactly. they're all illicit. Yep. Uh, this is probably a much better choice for him. It's interesting. So most of the time, weapons that don't do plus one damage are bad. This I, one does plus one damage situationally. Yeah, I think you have to take the horror. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you have to attack multiple times, you know, of course, you prefer not to take too much horror. Because uh, you're only going to heal once. Right. Um, but you can always put the horror on Pete. So I'm thinking mm. if you have Pete, it might be worth it. Sure. Yeah. Great. Great point. That's that's a natural combo. Um, and it's great against two hit point enemies, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> you just take the horror, heal it right back up. Yep. I also think if anyone really wants to make a fighter Carolyn, this will just help her make money. Now, you will need other cards to boost your fight. <laughs> Um, because like plus one is not going to be enough to right. actually you know hit anything with Carolyn, but if you really want to make it work and you want to include beat cops and the guardian taros to get her fight up to like five or six, um, she will make money as she kills things, which is pretty funny. That is true. I like it. <laughs> okay, shall we move on? Yep. Okay, so you've seen the previews. Yes. Which are the gold cards? I want to. Uh, say a, a piece about these, and then I will evaluate them individually as, as they are. I don't like these. No. <laughs> I think that, so, I think they're good for one reason. I think that LCGs struggle with having, like, splashy, exciting new mechanics and things, like 
Magic the Gathering and collectible games tend to do, like Magic, like 21 years in, it's like all of a sudden your creatures are piloting vehicles and smashing them into each other and it's brand new. LCGs tend to be a lot more even and I think that's to their detriment because it's harder to get excited about the newest product. So this I think shows that the designers understand that mm -hmm. because they're splashy, they're cool, they have this beautiful gold border that I do really like, they have multiple icons on them, they're awesome. But I think they fail at execution. Like they're, when these were previewed, I looked down, I kind of looked down the list and with almost all of these, like 70 plus percent of investigators can take them and a good handful of investigators can take four or five of them. So they're practically neutral. Mm -hmm. You would expect them to be more centric around like classes and, and the, what the classes mean and, mm -hmm. and what it means to be the, or like what you have access to because of the class you're playing. But in reality, actually most investigators can take most of these and they feel very neutral. And then flavor wise, I think they're kind of a miss too. Like you would think, like take the Enchanted Blade. It's actually, I've never read the text on Enchanted Blade yeah. because we don't look ahead, but I've seen that, that it's a thing. And it's a, some sort of magical blade and it's the, it's, it feels like it's the combination of Mystic and Guardian because Guardians get all the weapons and Mystics get all the relics or um, cool magical stuff. So it feels like, oh, flavor-wise it seems like the Guardian Mystics should get this badass thing, but it actually turns out that almost everyone can get it. And all you have to do is be Guardian or Mystic and you get access to both sides of that. And I feel like that's kind of a miss for just the kind of the badass wow factor that they're going mm -hmm. for here. Yeah, it's tough when most investigators can take at least two classes, and then these are two classes to mm -hmm. not make it available to everyone. Like maybe they could have had some rule where like it's only available to the primary investigators in those two. You know? Yeah. So actually, like, if this required you to be a guardian or a rogue and not just you know have access to those cards, I would like that quite a bit better. At least we wouldn't have done which investigators that <laughs> could literally put all five of these. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in their decks. Speaking of which, did you see the way the rules shook out for these? Yeah, so <laughs> when these were previewed, people were worried that like if you were a rogue, uh, let's say Jenny, and you took uh, a guardian rogue card, that because it was also a guardian card, that it would count as one of your five out of faction slots. And to be clear, they were worried because the preview article specifically said that, <laughs> that was the case, right? <laughs> it wasn't speculation. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that seemed kind of unintuitive. It's like, well, like, Jenny's a rogue, this is a rogue card, like, why would it take one of her five out of faction? Right. Why would you get taxed for taking this rogue card? Yeah. yeah. So they, they released sort of a, a little bit of extra clarification with the pack that says that if, it's, if they include other in their deck building uh, requirements, that it does not count towards their out of faction slots. Right. Um, which is pretty and arbitrary. It's arbitrary and it is literally all the investigators. All the investigators that even cared about this, I have limited slots thing, they all have others somewhere in their text. So it's literally, it's like a, a band-aid to the original version of this rule that m makes the rule go away, but it does it in a really arcane way that has you hunting for this word in the <laughs> yeah. paragraphs of deck building rules. Not impressed, I gotta be honest. Yeah, it, I feel like they could have worded it better, um, but you know, if you're, if you're listening at home, just Anyone who has out of faction slots, if they're in one of these factions, don't worry about it using up the slots. Like that's that's the simple answer. Right, right. And actually, yeah, if you don't religiously refresh the um, PDF, like I do for some <laughs> reason, uh, the printed rules in the pack don't have that. It actually mm -hmm. must have gotten updated after this pack went to print. So make mm -hmm. sure that you take a peek at the PDF. It's on the Fantasy Flight Game site that they put. Um, they assemble each pack's campaign logs into kind of one PDF, and it has the updated rules there with that other exception that applies to all investigators other than book promos. <laughs> yeah. Okay, with that off my chest, <laughs> I do love the way these beautiful cards look, and I'm excited to see what they do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Want to take us through 45 Thompson? Sure. So this is a Guardian Rogue card, six cost uh, asset. It's got five ammo. It's a uh, firearm, and it's illicit, and it's an item, so a lot of generally good traits. Um, and for an action, you can spend an ammo to fight with plus two fight and plus one damage. Oh, hmm. and it's two hand slots. Two hand slots, right. Used by both gangsters and police officers, the fully automatic Thompson submachine gun was favored due to its accuracy and high volume of fire. So, all right, they do kind of use the flavor text to justify uh -huh. why yeah. you know, yeah. one or the other can take it. Doesn't explain how Carolyn gets it, but <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. Hmm. Um... If you've got the money laying around, this card is awesome, mm -hmm. right? I think pound for pound, it is the strongest level zero firearm. 
Yeah, I think it's the only plus two um, that's sort of unconditional and... Right. Um, you know, like that cleaver that we just saw is plus two some of the time. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then five ammo is often enough to last you pretty much the game. Yeah, yeah, though I'm actually instantly thinking of like maybe sleight of handing this out because I'm more worried about the hand slots. Um, mm -hmm. So that lets you still put out a flashlight later or, or something else. Yeah, good point. Um, that you want the hand slots for. And I'm looking at this and thinking about how much I've been enjoying the upgraded bandolier. Mm -hmm. And the it's a willpower boost that, that you get if you have two hand slots full of weapons, and this is another option without having to upgrade to something expensive like oh. a shotgun to take advantage of that. Yeah, so this might be good in Diana. Um, you know, she only has hmm. three fight, so getting her up to four fight, uh, getting up to five fight, um, and then you know if you have bandolier, it's also helping her will. So <laughs> I'm really enjoying the mental image right now of Diana <laughs> in her cultist robes with this Tommy gun. <laughs> <laughs> Busting down the Silver Twilight Lodge door. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and then Finn, it's illicit. So, if, like, I tried to make illicit Finn work with, like, you know, putting all the illicit cards in. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like it was quite there yet, but maybe this becomes a little better. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could see it. I would give it a try. The only thing that's kind of weird to me is that, so they're going to do upgraded versions of these multi-class cards, right? I saw the previews. They, um, I think we don't know for a fact that they're doing it for all of them, uh -huh. but... They're doing it for at least some, yeah. Because there already is a high XP rogue Tommy gun, the Chicago typewriter. Right. So if they also have a XP rogue 45 Thompson, that's pretty confusing to me. <laughs> hmm. That's a great point. <laughs> I I guess we'll just have to live with it. <laughs> I don't I doubt that they're going to deviate if they're giving us upgraded versions of all of them. I think we're getting uh -huh. one here. Yep. And yeah, you just I guess. Is the, the other one's not the other one you're talking about is Chicago typewriter, right? But that's a nickname. So, I, mean, so I can I, still call this Tommy Gun at least. I guess, and, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> everyone, we have to all agree not to call Chicago typewriter a Tommy Gun. I suppose. <laughs> and I guess we'll be okay. <laughs> okay, the Scroll of Secrets is the Seeker and Mystic card. It's a one cost item and tome asset. It uses three secrets, takes up a hand slot, and says as an action. Exhaust Scroll of Secrets and spend one secret. Oh, it's, it's the Scroll of Secrets and Easy Secrets. I just, I, I just enjoyed that for the first time. That was, that's good. <laughs> Look at the bottom card of any Investigator's deck or the Encounter deck, the bottom card. Then either discard that card, add it to its owner's hand, place it on the bottom of its deck, or place it on the top of its deck. Pretty flexible. I, I'm a... I'm a well-known hater of scrying, <laughs> but I think I like this better. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a tome, so it's a free action in Daisy. Um, oh, right. So, you know, but it doesn't... Um, yeah, I guess you can. it can help someone draw. Um, you know, if you're going for combos, it uh, could be good. I saw someone made a infinite combo reader recently. <laughs> so, you know, if you're trying to support out that character, um, I could definitely see putting this in. I missed that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a look for that. Um, but the other use is actually my Joe has the doomed weakness and has drawn it in his first two games. But this looks at the bottom card of your deck. Yeah, but you can put it on the top. And that ensures that if it's not doomed, it ensures that the card you draw next won't be doomed either. All right, you can spend a card or resource in three actions for three safe draws. And it's yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's it's pretty bad, but it's I think it's. I, I mean, I have played a doomed character <laughs> <laughs> through an entire campaign only to die two actions from the end of Lost in Time and Space. So I know the stress that comes with playing doomed, and I love it actually. I love that card. But man, even if I was doomed, th that seems like <laughs> a really large investment for pretty minimal benefit. Yeah, that's not great. <laughs> All right, next card. Sure. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Tennessee Sour Mash. Speaking um, of which, would you like a refill? Sure. Some Jack Daniels? What a coincidence that we were <laughs> drinking Jack Daniels. I know, right? So this is also illicit. So mm -hmm. the... Cheers. Cheers. So yeah, this is another illicit item. So I think mm. you know the the Finn illicit smuggling deck is is becoming better, maybe. Yeah, Preston's not getting any better. Uh, though he, it's not an illicit weapon. I think he can take it. Is that right? I think so. I think it's just illicit weapons he can't take. 
Hmm. I'll fact check that. I thought it was all illicit cards, but... So, okay. yeah, so this has got two supplies. Um, as a fast action, you can exhaust it and spend one supply to get plus two will for a skill test on treachery. Uh, you can also, for an action, discard it to fight with plus three attack, but no extra damage. I love the flavor of this card. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. <laughs> you take two big gulps of the liquor, <laughs> then break the bottle and fight with it. Definitely. <laughs> big flavor win. Is it good? Uh, it's expensive. It is. So basically, for three and a card mm -hmm. and an action, you're getting two guts, which is no actions, it's no money, and provides card draw. Um, and you can't stack them either, because it exhausts. Yep. Um, and the only other benefit of it over guts is this fight ability, but it doesn't do any extra damage, so it's yeah. you know it's pretty rare that it's like oh if I had a couple more attack for one damage really matters you know right. Um, the hmm. one use I could maybe see of it is in Preston, assuming Preston can take it. Um, he there's some builds that run Joey the Rat, so they can play uh, items for like no actions. Oh sure. Um, and you know, and the money's not a big deal for him, um, and and maybe it helps him not get as much horror on a rotting remains or something. Um, <laughs> sure. Or maybe you combo it with Dark Horse or something to actually get your will high enough to pass. Um, I can maybe see it there. Um, otherwise, I'm not seeing a ton of use for it. Yeah, I think yeah, I think your comparison was spot on, and that's kind of all I can think about now. I look at this and like I would usually rather have guts. Yep. And guts is a card that, as the card pool's grown, like is not as widely played as it used to be. So I can see myself playing this card again, just because I will. I love playing flavorful decks and yep. having fun situations arise during the game, and it's a badass flavor. Definitely. <laughs> but I will put it in knowing that I think I'm <laughs> handicapping my deck a little bit because it's not that great. Yeah. Hey, here's the Enchanted Blade I brought up Ooh, earlier. Okay. Excited to read this. All right. It is a Mystic and Guardian card. Mm -hmm. A three-cost asset with four traits. It's an item, a relic, a weapon, and it's melee. It uses three charges and oh, and a hand and arcane slot. Ooh, ooh. That's painful. Interesting. That's painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have this and the um, sign magic, and you're already <laughs> out of hands. <laughs> But anyway, as an action you can fight, you get plus one combat for this attack. As an additional cost to initiate this ability, you may spend one charge to empower the blade. If you do, you get plus one combat and deal plus one damage for this attack. So, what do you think? So, I saw the picture of it, and I figured this would be a Diana card. I cannot see any mystic playing this. Like, giving up an arcane slot for a weapon, which is not your main the main thing that you do mm -hmm. just doesn't make any sense to me. So I think this has to be in a fighter that doesn't care about arcane slots. And you know what? Right before I threw it over to you, I was going to say, I can't see any guardians. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right, too. <laughs> because it just doesn't compare favorably to most of the guns, right? Like, most of them have more ammo and maybe do one less damage, or, sorry, um, get one less combat, but guardians usually have a lot of combat anyway, and they care more about the damage that they're getting from their weapons. And you only get that damage the first, or when you use the three charges on this, and then it's just a knife. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the only things that it has is is the ability to do the plus one, and mm -hmm. also it is a relic. So there are some oh. things that care about being damaged by relics. Um, but mm. Mm, that's yeah. a good point. Um, overall, pretty weak. Yeah. I'm. Um, hmm. It's cool. I really like these cards. Just. Mm. The, the, uh, like aesthetically, and I like they, they, I don't know, a magical blade is cool, it's badass. Yeah. I might play it for that reason, but again, it's not really giving me any bright ideas. Yeah, and I if they do make an upgraded Mystic version of this, I really hope it doesn't take an Arcane slot, because then I feel like it'll just never get played. Yeah. Or it'll have to be do something amazing. It would have to be quite a bit better than Shriveling. <laughs> <right>? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Hmm. Okay. Last card, why don't you take it? All right, Grizzly Totem. This is a Survivor Seeker card, uh, also a three-cost asset. Um, item and Charm. Uh, and as a fast uh, response, after you commit a card to a skill test, Exhaust Grizzly Totem, this card gains another instance of one of its skill icons of your choice. And it says, we should have thrown it back immediately, but how could we have known? Hmm. 
So the accessory slot is pretty open for survivors and seekers, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I like rabbit's foot, I like chair's keepsake, but, you know, they're not like mm. must-haves. Yeah, I, th I think I like this. These, it's not a talent, most of the time they're talents, but I, I really like the talents that mm -hmm. exhaust to add to a skill test and don't generally don't cost resources, or at least refund the resources <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you pass, that find another way to boost your, your skills besides mm -hmm. just... Um, besides just resources, and even though this isn't a talent, it's basically one of those cards. Mm -hmm. I think I like it. Yeah, I think um, Min probably plays it. Um, she has so many skill cards in her deck. Um, oh, and just reading this, it doesn't have to be your skill test. You can commit a card to someone else's skill test and also give that oh, person a plus one. Yeah. So Min, once she has her asset, can do that remotely. Yeah. Clearly a great Min card, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it's not officially out yet, but there's a survivor card, uh, Silas, that some people have through buying a mm. book, who also has a skill-related abilities, use skills all the sure. time. So those are probably the first two that would use it, and then there might be some other build that, um, you know, we haven't thought of yet, but it uses a lot of skill cards. Right, but it's not skill cards to a skill test. True. Any card. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think honestly, this you like most turns you would get to exhaust this and take advantage of it. I think it's. I like it. I'm eager to try it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will be next videos. Well, I tried <laughs> it. It didn't work. Maybe, yeah. maybe it'll be my revisit. But I'm actually pretty optimistic about this one. Yep. Yeah, it seems stronger than a lot of these multi-class. <laughs> yeah. The, the first and last. Than the last, the last couple. Ag agreed. Agreed. <laughs> what do you think of the pack? Uh, you know, overall, um, kind of a mixed bag, but some cards I'm excited about. Um, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the Meat Cleaver, the Thompson, the Totem. Um, you know, I think it makes Diana a little more interesting. Yeah, I'm... It's, it's a pretty hit or miss pack, I think. Mm, yeah. Some of these, like Sign Magic... Um, something worth fighting for, I'm not excited by at all. Yeah. And other ones like Intel Report, I'm eager to try. Meat Cleaver, I think, is awesome. And a couple of these gold cards that we just discussed, the, the Tommy Gun and the Grizzly Totem, I'm really excited to try. So, you know what? If four or five cards in a pack really get you excited, it's, it's a decent pack. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, Preston gains a lot from this pack. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's like five cards here he could try. I mean, certainly Intel Report, but maybe Meat Cleaver, maybe the Thompson. Not the Thompson, it's Illicit. And that is an awesome oh, weapon. Yep, 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 you're right, you're right. Uh, maybe the Sour Mash, um, and I think Diana which, gets some. Which, it's a shame that he can't take the Tommy Gun, because always and forever now, anytime I see it cost like six, my first thought is going to be that's Preston. Totally, and yep, yep. Nope, always got to check those traits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, should we turn off the cameras and play some Markham? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed it, we're going to keep doing this through the cycle and beyond as the plan. So subscribe so you don't miss it and check out our other videos. And until next time, be optimal. Take care.